Yeah, good evening. Uh, today is a continuation of our previous class on uh, cirrhosis, where uh, today we will be dealing with management of cirrhosis and its complications. So I welcome Dr. Santosh, uh, who has been the guest moderator for the previous class and today also. So he'll be taking over and uh, moderating the session. So I request Indraja to start off with the class. So we'll be interrupting if any doubts or any questions any time in between. Good evening, good evening, sir. Good evening to everyone. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. You are. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, today, I am going to discuss about the management of cirrhosis of liver. Cirrhosis of liver, it is an emergent health issue because of the increasing prevalence of the disease and its complication. So, the primary care physicians plays an important role in identification of the risk factors and also in the management of patients for improving the quality and length of life and preventing complications. So it is an important to uh, integrated approach between the specialist and primary care physicians for providing better outcomes and appropriate health care. I'm going to discuss about the prevention and the dif uh, different complications of the cirrhosis and their management. And I, I'm also going to discuss about the hepatocellular carcinoma. The primary prevention is aimed at the prevention of the risk factors that triggering the hepatic fibrosis. This includes uh, the mass infant vaccination of the hepatitis B infection. And also we have to screen the blood donors uh, before the transmission for the hepatitis C virus. And the secondary prevention aims at the prevention of the appearance of the cirrhosis in patients with chronic liver disease. It includes the treatment of the vital hepatitis, alcohol abstinence, and improving the insulin resistance in non-alcoholic steta hepatitis patients. And we have to do the uh, follow-up of the patients for the hepatocellular carcinoma by six-monthly follow-up with ultrasonography and blood alpha fetoprotein levels. And the prevention of infections can be achieved by immunization of against hepatitis A, B viruses, and pneumococcus and influenza viruses. There are uh, different complications of the cirrhosis, which includes esophageal viruses, ascites, hepatic encephalopathy, hepatorenal syndrome, and secondary bacterial infections and pleural effusion. Of this, esophageal viruses is most common complication of the cirrhosis, followed by the ascites. The gastroesophageal viruses or dilated submucosal veins in the digestive tract due to the portal hypertension that can cause life-threatening bleeding. And the prevalence of varices increases with severity of the liver disease, which is mostly seen in the uh, class C of the child puke scoring system, which who have 75% of the risk of developing the esophageal varices. And the incidence is around 5% at the end of one year and 28% at the end of three years. And the annual risk of varicel bleeding among small and large varices is 5% and 15% respectively. And the six-week mortality rate with an index varicel bleeding is 20%. The risk of re-bleeding without endoscopic intervention is 60% with an increased mortality rate of 33%. Portal hypertension, it is defined as portal pressure gradient greater than 5 millimeters of mercury. It is an increased pressure in the portal vein and its, its tributaries. The normal portal venous pressure is 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. The hepatic venous pressure gradient, it is the pressure gradient between the portal vein and inferior vena cava. Normally, it is about 1 to 5 millimeters of mercury. In compensated cirrhosis, it is around 6 to 10 millimeters of mercury, which shows a subclinical portal hypertension. If it is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, mercury the patients will develop complications of portal hypertension. And if it is more than 12 millimeters of mercury, patients will develop varicel rupture and bleeding. This is the algorithm showing the pathogenesis of the uh, esophageal varices. The hepatocellular injury, which, uh, which leads to the portal fibrosis and endothelial dysfunction, that causes increased intrahepatic resistance and the release of vascular endothelial growth factor that causes planknic and systemic vasodilatation that leads to the increased portal blood flow and portal hypertension. If it is more that hepatic uh, venous pressure gradient, if it is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, that leads to the development of gastroesophageal varices. And the mechanism of varicel bleeding explained by the Frank's uh, modified Laplace law 
which measure the wall tension as a uh, uh, pressure difference between the varices and lumen uh, in the lumen into the varicel radius divided by the varicel wall thickness and the risk of varicel bleeding can be ex explained by the different factors as as below which includes hepatic venous pressure gradient more than 12 mm of hg and large varices of <coughs> more than 5 mm size and wall tension that is presence of red well sign that is dilated capillaries on the varicel wall and other factors like presence of coagulopathy infection and decompensated cirrhosis and gastric varices are com uh, less frequent compared to the esophageal varices and which accounts for the 20% of all varicel bleeding the predictors for bleeding of uh, from the gastric varices includes its location and severity of the liver disease and stigmata of high risk of bleeding such as red flame sign and uh, the uh, the cl sarin classification system for the uh, class uh, gastric varices which includes gastroesophageal varices type 1 and type 2 type 1 is extending along the lesser curvature type 2 is extending along the greater curvature and isolated gastric varices type 1 and type 2 type 1 seen in the fundus and type 2 is seen in the body pylorus and antra and when coming to the management of the varices in the absence of prior varicel bleed bleed uh, we should consider non selective beta blockers or endoscopic varicel ligation in case of medium or large esophageal varices the non selective beta blockers includes propranolol nadolol and carbidolol these non selective beta blockers were preferred when compared to the uh, endoscopic varicel ligation because of their low cost, easy availability, and ability to reduce the hepatic venous pressure gradient. According to a study which is comparing the EVL and propranolol versus EVL alone, this study showed that uh, addition of propranolol to the EVL it does not reduce the risk of uh, first varicel blade. And however, but the recurrence of varices was significantly lower when, uh, when propranolol was added. And this combination is not recommended for primary prophylaxis because of the side effects. And nitrates are in transhepatic, uh, in uh, transnuclear intrahepatic photosystemic shunt and sclerotherapy are not recommended for primary prophylaxis of the varicel bleeding. And management of the acute varicel hemorrhage, we should res resuscitate the patient first. We have to protect the airway and we have to achieve the hemodynamic stability. And the prognostic indicators of the early mortality includes hepatic venous pressure gradient, child puke scoring system, and uh, model for end stage liver disease scoring system. We have to restrict the patients, uh, we have to rest uh, restrict the transfusion. All patients with HB less than 7 grams per deciliter should get the pack itself, but we have to maintain the hemoglobin at eight to, uh, 7 to 8 grams per deciliter. And vas different vasoactive agents like activated terlipresin, stomatostatin, and vasopressin were used to control the bleeding. And we should start the antibiotics in all patients suspected with uh, suspected and confirmed varicel bleeding in order to reduce the infection, secondary bacterial infections. And the endoscopic management includes upper GI endoscopy, which shows actively bleeding varices and signs of recent bleeding and presence of varices and blood in the stomach. Endoscopic varicel ligation, it is the first line endo endoscopic treatment for the management of bleeding. The advantages include it achieves better hemostasis and lower rate of side effects and reduce the rate of early bleeding. The other methods include Sengestan Blackmore tube, metal stunts, transjugular intrahepatic photosystem action, and balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. The Sengestan Blackmore tube, it achieves a hemostasis at a rate of 47 to 80%, and it, uh, it controls a refractive bleeding up to 90% of the patients. The limitations of this method include aspiration, airway obstruction, esophageal perforation, perforation because of the overinflation. And the metal stunts, these are the self-expanding fully covered metal stunts that can achieve hemostasis of 80% to 96%. And these can be left in place up to two weeks. The adverse, uh, the adverse reactions of these stunts include stunt migration seen in 28% of the patients, deep bleeding and ulcers, transjugular intrahepatic photosystemic shear, 
It involves implantation of the metallic stent between the intrahepatic branch of the portal vein and hepatic vein radical, but it requires an experienced interventional radiologist. It controls the varicel bleeding in more than 90% of the patients. The possible complications of this method includes bleeding intra either intraabdominal or via biliary tree and infections and decreased hepatic function. And balloon occluded retrograde transvenous obliteration. This can be done in patients with spontaneous gastrorenal or splenorenal shunts on enhanced CT imaging. This technique using a transjugular or transfemoral approach, a balloon occlusion catheter is directed to the left renal vein into the spontaneous shunt, which is then obliterated with use of sclerosin agent. The surgical sh shunting, it can be considered in patients with following uh, conditions who have male score less than 15, who are not the candidates for hepatic transplantation and who have limited access to the TIPS therapy. This includes uh, the uh, portocaval shunt, mesocaval shunt, and uh, varin shunt. The portocaval shunt, it joins the portal vein to the inferior vena cava in end to side fashion. It completely disturbs the portal vein flow. It is rarely performed because of the high incidence of the hepatic encephalopathy. In mesocaval shunt, there is a polytetrafluoroethylene graft that connects the superior mesenteric vein to the inferior vena cava. And varin shunt, it is most commonly used shunt. This is the uh, image showing the different uh, types of this shunt. And non shunt surgical management of the refractory varicel bleeding. In extrahepatic portal vein thrombosis and in uh, refractory varicel bleeding, sugaria procedure may be considered. This procedure consists of extensive devascularization of the stomach and distal esophagus, along with transection of the esophagus, splenectomy, truncal vagotomy, and pyloroplasty. The secondary prophylaxis includes combination of non-selective beta blockers and endoscopic varicel ligation. The main goal is to eradicate the varices and prevent recurrent bleeding. Tips can be considered in patients who don't, do not tolerate or fail the combination of the non-selective beta blockers and EVA. Any questions, sir? Yeah. Yes, sir. Indraja, yes, just sir. go. Just go back to that figure which showed all the shunts, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Just explain uh, what each of them you know, entails. Sir, in this, uh, in this, uh, this is the portocaval shunt. In this uh, portal vein is uh, anastomosed to the inferior vena cover by side to side fashion, sir. This is end to side portocaval shunt. And uh, this is the mesocaval shunt, and uh, this is the uh, distal splenorenal uh, shunt where the uh, spleen, uh, distal uh, splenic vein is anastomosed to the left renal vein. Now you are talking about all these methods. Yes, sir. Practically, what is done? So mostly uh, we'll use uh, uh, varin shunt, sir. Actually, none of the shunts are done these days. Okay. Uh, I think the only thing that is being done is esophageal, the soon, rubber band, like, band ligation. Band ligation. Yes. That is the only thing that is done these days. Okay. Things taken, black mode tube is not used. Yes, sir. Uh, shunts are not used. I think tips are only used if, uh, you know, I think if, if uh, after you have done the endoscopic uh, ligation. Yes, sir. Uh, you, if, if you feel that the tips is required, you may use the tips. But I don't think anything, they, all the other things are mentioned for posterity. I don't think anybody... Sir, tips also, the, if you're planning only uh, yeah. liver transplantation, Correct. then you buy time. No, Otherwise, that's what, that also, I don't think it's... Yeah. No, that's what I said. You know, basically, yes, sir, yes, sir. very, very selectively, I think surgery as a procedure for uh, esophageal varices is virtually given up. So, Lakshman, sir? I agree with that. What is primarily important is that whatever you do, the surgeon who does the primary surgery for uh, so, you know, uncontrollable variceal bleed, the surgeon must make sure that it does not, does not jeopardize or make difficult a possible future transplant, yeah. liver transplant. That is the main point. Yeah. And uh, Indraja, you need to tell us about the advantages and disadvantages of each of these procedures. Are you going to do that later? Um, 
all these things that you have listed no sir as a surgeon you must know what are the indications contraindications advantages and disadvantages of each one of these procedures okay yeah so when you say okay what does it mean you will go I'll, home and read or uh... yes i'll read and i'll put it <laughs> ah, so yes. okay okay all right shorts would have given you all this uh, ja, 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 ja. if you had read shorts yes he would have given you all these details right what is you know why why what are the advantages disadvantages just think about it now yes i agree with ravi and niranjan none of this is actually done now so if you as niranjan said if you want a non invasive method do a tips to buy time before a transplant or if there is an acute bleed which cannot be controlled by endoscopic means which is not very usual because most of them are controlled by endoscopic means uh, failing that if there is a torrential bleed you go in and do a devascularization yeah, yeah. procedure yes. okay the siguras yes sir and that has no effect whatsoever yeah. on a future transplant yeah. and if you find that forever you are not going to bother about a transplant for various socio economic reasons then if you want long lasting uh, Uh, effects then use a shunt which does not give you a high incidence of hepatic encephalopathy yes. okay and yes. that would be a toss up between a warren shunt as you rightly mentioned or a non shunt procedure like devascularization yes yeah. yeah all right please yes, go ahead yeah yes sir can i continue sir so there is a question comments? There is a question yeah. in the chat box. The uh, Indraja. Yes, so sir. So where else? Uh, I mean, everybody has commented about the position of uh, shunt surgeries in the recent times. Yes, sir. Where else can you use these shunt surgeries? Are you aware of a condition called non-serotic portal hypertension? Ah, oh, yes, sir. Uh, this uh, non-serotic portal hypertension mostly seen in Bucciari syndrome and uh, portal vein thrombosis. Mm. I think Bucciari doesn't come under that. Yes. Non-serotic portal hypertension. There are two main conditions: EHPVO, uh, extra hepatic portal vein obstruction, yes, and NCPF, and the, yeah, and the NCPF, which is non-serotic portal fibrosis. Yes. So I think the choice of shunt, I think Dr. Lakshman sir may be able to tell which one. Yeah, I mean when the cirro when there is when there is no cirrhosis, the mm. chances of hepatic encephalopathy is minimal. Minimal, yeah. So you can use any of these shunts, uh, depending on the expertise and availability. The porta cable is the easiest shunt to do. So in a non-serotic, even that doesn't matter. Uh, but what is more physiological would be a, either a mesocable shunt. When you find that, you know, when would you do a mesocable shunt? I can give you all the answers, but it's I want you guys to think about it. When I say porta cable shunt, you need a good portal vein and a good inferior vena cava. All right. So yeah. why did the miso cable shunt even come? Why did why did people have to think about it? Hurry, portal vein thrombosis. Sir. All yeah. right. So what happens in a portal vein thrombosis? Sir, uh, this uh, uh, un uh, anastomosis cannot be done. So like why so not? Centric vein we can anastomose in. With why the not? You're right. But what happens? What is the pathophysiology of portal vein thrombosis? Right. There is what is called a cavernomatous mm -hmm. transformation of the portal vein. Yes. There is no one big portal vein that you can get hold of and anastomose to vena cava. All right. So it is it is replaced by collaterals or neo vessel formation, if you like, with my small several small channels which are not suitable for anastomosis. So you in a, in an extra hepatic portal vein obstruction, it is difficult. You know, with a cavernomatous transformation of portal vein, difficult to do or almost impossible to do, porta cable shunt. So you have to put a graft between the superior mesenteric vein and the vena cava. Yes. Yeah. You know the difference. Why are you putting a graft? Why not anastomose 
superior you know superior mesenteric vein to the vena cava these are very fundamental question if i give you the answer with if you don't give it yourself you'll kick yourself if you see the your picture also shows a graft it doesn't show a direct anastomosis side to side anastomosis why the two veins don't meet each other it's very big, far away you far can't away. mobilize it you can't, you can't mobilize it you can't mobilize it to take it to the vena cava okay at the yes, root sir. of the mesentery you cannot mobilize it you cannot take the smv to the vena cava as simple as that as you can take the portal vein to the vena cava so you have to put a teflon graft to bridge the two veins and of course you always have the distal splenorenal shunt okay yes yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, sir, in left-sided portal hypertension, doing splenectomy itself is sufficient to, to overcome the portal hypertension. That is the segmental portal hypertension. Yeah, right. segmental so, portal hypertension. Yeah. yeah. That you splenectomy and uh, devascularization of the OG junction only yeah. would be enough in those cases. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. There are a few chat uh, box questions, Indraja. Yes, sir. First question, I think, from Lakshman sir only. Would we not put alcohol as a first step before hepatitis vaccination? Prevention. Uh, sir, first, uh, we have to stop the alcohol. Sir. Yeah, you know, you, yes, you mentioned it later. But yes. as I keep saying, even in complications, etiology, steps, yes, or whatever, sir. you must endeavor to do commonness to the rarest yes, in, that, in that order. That order is important. Okay, sir. It, it shows that you know, you know, it shows people that you know what the uh, game is, as it were. Okay, so yes, you must put cessation from alcohol or whatever else as the first step. Yes. Okay, next question is from uh, Ravishankar, sir. What is the role of elastography in the prevention of cirrhosis and HCC? I think that mainly for Santosh, I think. I don't yeah, know whether Santosh Indra can Jav answer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Santosh, two so things. As an addition to that, see the in patients with hepatitis B and C, um, yeah. redu reduction of the viral load has that got yeah. any role in terms of you know, prevention of progression to cirrhosis and subsequently to HCC? Those two questions you can answer as a con you know as a, a combination. So there are two things in hepatitis B. There is uh, enough evidence to show that. Uh, uh, suppression of the viral load, uh, the majority of the patients, they can, some of them may reverse, I mean, reverse into the advanced fibrosis stage, or at least we can delay the progression of cirrhosis to advance the like child C, and also the risk of HCC comes down. But with HCV, which hepatitis C, even after eradicating the virus, there is the, the risk of uh, HCG lingers on. That's why the active surveillance is required every six months. Yeah. And uh, yes, sir, that is what I would like to tell. And uh, in, HCC, uh, in hepatitis C related CLD, it's uh, something called as rule of uh, I mean one third, where one third of them improve, one third of them stay the same, and one third of them, even after eradicating the virus, the they progress further and their MELD scores go up and eventually they will require uh, transplantation. Okay. What about uh, the non this, uh, um, you know, the um, uh, fatty liver and NASH? So what is the role of elastography in, in monitoring, preventing a progression to cirrhosis? So NASH, when compared to alcohol and uh, to viral hepatitis, is a very slow progressing mm -hmm. Uh, cirrhosis, if you can. Many of them we pick at an early stage and they are uh, so I mean asymptomatic or less symptoms for at least three to four years and then their uh, downward pro I mean, progression happens. But with alcohol and uh, active viral hepatitis, uh, the progression is much faster. Sure, but what I, why I'm asking this question is many people now with the exceptionally good ultrasonic uh, examination and many of them get it as part of their clinical, you know, sort of, uh, you know, whatever the master health checkup or whatever, 
and everybody asks this question whenever patients have this um, you know fatty liver so what should i do about it so is there any role for you know doing elastography early and then you know monitoring it you know how do you advise these patients it definitely has a role provided the uh, elastography is done in the proper way um, we shouldn't be doing it till people who have bilirubin really of more than 3 or at least 2.5 it should it should be done with at least 3 hours of fasting <laughs> because if, if the scan is done in the immediate post prandial period the because of the increased portal blood flow there may be false high liver stiffness and uh, we may falsely label them as advanced fibrosis or fibrosis yeah and uh, in case of ascites we can't use uh, elastography there are other ways of doing elastography okay shall i continue sir yeah hari there is one more uh, sorry from hari there is one more question yes, what is uh, hyperdynamic circulatory syndrome <clears throat> So it, it is just the same what she explained, sir. But they call it hyperdynamic syndrome or else hyperlyrically circulatory syndrome. Uh, it is of high cardiac output and uh, uh, decreased uh, systemic vascular resistance, sir, with the mean arterial low mean arterial blood pressure. So these three they call hyperdynamic uh, syndrome. That's no. white pulse pressure. White pulse. Why is this important, Hari? It, Why are you? Yeah, it is just one question, like a late com- consequence of portal hypertension. I read somewhere about it, so I thought of asking. Okay, it's a combination. Oh, of cirrhotics have a higher incidence of CCF because of this hyperdynamic yes. circulation. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, Indraja, one more question. Yes, you sir. just brushed through that uh, some role of uh, terlipressin, octreotide, and other yes, uh, drugs. Yes, so sir. what is their role when do you use uh, do you use it at all for control of uh, acute arterial bleeding if yes when so if uh, like uh, in case of non bleeding varices sir like my medium or large sizes var- varices so we'll prescribe these non selective beta blockers sir and we'll... no 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 i'm not talking yes, about uh, beta blockers i'm talking about octreotide in varicel okay. bleeding acute varicel bleeding you just put up one sentence there yes, to sir. go back to the slide yes sir Yes. Sir. See, there vasoactive agents. Yes. Octreotide, terlipressin, somatostatin, vasopressin. Yes. Sir, so, uh, generally in case of acute varicel hemorrhage, uh, we'll first do endoscopic uh, ligation, sir. Then to con- uh, to decrease the pressure, we'll use all these uh, vasoactive agents, sir. No, no, no. no, no. Even no. even before we do endoscopy, the patient lands up in the suppose in the night. Okay. So you, we don't wait till the endoscopy is done. Yes. Suppose the patient is a known case of cirrhosis, we start terlipressin and we assume that it is mostly variceal bleed. But if the patient comes with the first episode of upper GI bleed and we don't know if he has cirrhosis or if it's an ulcer related bleed, we go by the other parameters, the platelet count, the INR, and if the uh, that's the reason why we get an ultrasound done to see the liver whether it's shrunken if there's any splenomegaly portal vein so based on these indirect evidences we start terlipressin or octreotide yes. regarding the choice of uh, what to use terlipressin or octreotide terlipressin is the most effective one but in certain cases of uh, suppose the patient has a coronary artery disease who is either he has had a stenting done or who is on medical management terlipressin has shown some side effect that they can have further aggravation of their cardiac condition in those conditions we prefer octreotide or somatostatin yes so indraja did you understand Patient yes sir yes sir i understood gi bleed you try and determine whether it is ulcer disease or you know portal hypertension and start them on octreotide or terlipressin stabilize the patient transfuse them and all that and then the endoscopy is okay. done within the 6 to 8 hours or uh, next day morning yes. they come in the middle of the night okay okay continue yes. 
in the ascites it is the second most complication of the cirrhosis and uh, most of the uh, seven, uh, around uh, 75 percent of the patients with ascites have underlying cirrhosis and it, ascites may also seen in other conditions like malignancy heart failure tuberculosis and pancreatitis and in uncomplicated ascites is not infected and not associated with development of the hepatorenal syndrome it can be in, divided into three types mild moderate and larger Mild is only detectable by ultrasound examination and large is marked abdominal distension. In refractory ascites, it can't be mobilized or early recurrence of which can't be satisfactorily prevented by medical therapy. It can be diuretic resistant and diuretic intractable. The diuretic resistant is it is refractory to dietary sodium and intensive diuretic treatment. And diuretic intractable ascites is refractory to therapy due to the development of the uh, diuretic induced complications that preclude the use of an effective diuretic dosage. And we should evaluate the uh, ascetic, uh, ascetic, uh, causes of the ascites. We have to perform the diagnostic paracentesis and ascetic fluid analysis and ascetic fluid cytology. The ascetic fluid neutrophil count, if it is more than 250 cells per millimeter cube, it shows it is diagnosed as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Most, most of the 30% uh, of the cirrhotics with bloody ascites uh, diagnosed with hepatocellular carcinoma. If the ascetic fluid is rich in amylase, it is diagnosed of the, diagnostic of the pancreatic ascites. And we have, uh, uh, we have to uh, also look for the serum ascites and albumin gradient. The serum ascetic albumin gradient, it is the difference between the serum albumin concentration and ascetic fluid albumin concentration. If it is more than 11 grams per uh, liter, we we'll suspect cirrhosis, cardiac failure, and nephrotic syndrome. In case of malignancy, pancreatitis, and tuberculosis, it is less than 11 grams per liter. The treatment of the ascites, uh, we should dietary, uh, restrict the dietary salt and to a no added salt diet of 90 millimoles per salt per day, that is 5.2 grams salt per day. The first line treatment includes spinal lactam alone, which the dose can be increased up uh, from 100 micrograms per day to a dose of 400 milligrams per day. If this fails, we can add a uh, furosemide in a dose of up to 160 milligrams per day, but it should be done with careful monitoring of the biochemical and clinical parameters. And therapeutic paracentesis is first line treatment in case of large refractory ascites. If the paracentesis is of less than 5 liters of uncomplicated ascites, we should give the plasma expansion with systemic plasma expander, but it does not require a volume expansion with albumin. If in case of large volume paracentesis, a single session of volume expansion being given when paracentesis is complete, the, we preferably using 8 grams of albumin per liter of ascites removed that is around 100 ml of 20% albumin for 3 liters of ascites. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, the prevalence is around 10% to 30%, uh, 30%. And the diagnosis requires the presence of absolute polymorphonuclear leukocyte count more than 250 cells per mm cube in the ascetic fluid without an evidence of intra-abdominal and surgically treatable source of infection. In case of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, we should start the empirical antibiotic on the, day of, on the day of diagnosis without the cultural reports. We can start the third generation cephalosporins like cefatoxin. In case of established spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, oral ofloxacin can be started. It can be as efficacious as intravenous cefatoxin. And patients with ongoing renal impairment, we can add albumin at 1.5 grams per kg in first six hours, followed by one gram per kg on day three. And the prophylaxis of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis includes continuous oral norfloxacin 400 mg per day or ciprofloxacin at 500 mg once daily doses. Hepatic encephalopathy, it is a complex of neuropsychiatric condition ranging from mild confusion to coma and death. It is related to the toxic compounds generated by the gut bacteria, such as um, ammonia and short chain fatty acid. These, uh, these products are transported by portal vein to the liver and hepatocytes will metabolize these products. In case of cirrhosis, the hepatocytes unable to metabolize these products. These uh, so hence they bypass the liver through the collaterals that leads to the hepatic encephalopathy. 
and the west heaven criteria for grading of the hepatic encephalopathy which includes four grades grade one is trivial lack of awareness impaired performance and grade two is lethargy and minimal disorientation for time and place and grade three is somnolence but responsive to verbal stimuli and grade four is coma that is un unresponsive to verbal stimuli and in case of management of the hepatic encephalopathy includes nutrition the aim should provide the total energy intake of about 35 to 40 kilocalories per kg daily and should not be protein restricted a protein intake of 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kg should per kg per day should be maintained the first line pharmacological therapy include lactylase which improves the treatment in 70 to 80% of the patient the usual dose is 30 to 45 ml two to four times per day and rifaximin it is a non absorbable antibiotic used at a dose of 550 mg twice daily or 400 mg thrice daily neomycin it is a food and drug administrative approved for the treatment of acute hepatic encephalopathy but not chronic hepatorenal syndrome wait 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 yes wait. sir uh, yes so any questions till now indraja yes sir what is the most important thing uh, that you have to monitor and be aware of in patients with hepatic encephalopathy apart from all the things that you have described like anybody, anybody else no answer ammonia ha huh. ammonia not ammonia ammonia you already mentioned ammonia yes sir see these people are prone to developing severe and sometimes refractory hypoglycemia so you have to be very careful you have to give them regular or continuous you know glucose infusion because liver is kind of packed up so it is not able to you know metabolize the So sugars, yes, so sir. they will be profoundly hypoglycemic, and many times they die because of that. So you have to make sure that they are, you know, given sometimes even twenty percent, fifty percent glucose is administered. Yes. Santosh, any Santosh, any 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 clarification? Yeah, I think I think she has covered uh, fairly uh, okay. management. Oh, in your, uh, but the only thing is the neomycin we we don't yeah, use yeah, that much. we don't use it that much uh, as it was used before okay and, any uh, specific reasons uh, i'm not very sure sir it's not available it is not available okay it's not available, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not available. and rifaxim is much safer and yeah okay continue yes sir yes in hepatorenal syndrome the incidence is around 18% and 13 39% at 1 and 5 years it is classified into two types type 1 it is doubling of creatinine to a level greater than 2.5 mg per deciliter in less than 2 weeks and type 2 is progressive uh, loss of renal function the diagnostic criteria for hepatic renal syndrome includes chronic or acute hepatic disease with hep advanced hepatic failure and portal hypertension and the serum creatinine level is more than 1.5 mg per deciliter and there is no sustained improvement of creatinine even after uh, it, uh, after the at least two days of diuretic withdrawal and no current or recent treatment with nephrotoxic drug, nephrotoxic drugs and the absence of parenchymal disease as indicated by the proteinuria and my, microhematuria and the management includes we should uh, avoid the excessive fluid trans administration to prevent the volume overload and hyponatremia and most common drug com combination is uh, albumin along with uh, midodrin and actiotet trial of trelipresin and al albumin versus albumin alone showed an improvement in creatinine clearance the use of albumin and norepinephrine or vasopressin can be considered in icu setting and hepatopulmonary syndrome it is a triad of liver dysfunction in intrapulmonary vasodilatation and arterial oxygenation defect the prevalence is 10% to 17% and the role of medical therapy is limited in hepatopulmonary syndrome 
liver transplantation should be considered in these patients and it improves five years survival from 23 percent to 63 percent and this is the algorithm showing the uh, management of the complications of the cirrhosis of the liver in case of the medium or large varices we have to prescribe beta blockers along with endoscopic varicell ligation and small varices we have to fo follow up the patients with endoscopy in case of ascites we should salt restrict and start diuretics and hepatic encephalopathy, we have to start rifaximin and we have to perform the uh, paracentesis. If it is positive, then we have to start the antibiotic therapy. And all patients of cirrhosis, we have to screen for the hepatocellular carcinoma every six months to 12 months using imaging and blood parameters like alpha beta protein levels. And the key recommendations for the practice include the screening and prevention of the uh, screening and prevention, which includes the uh, screen for the alcohol abuse and we should uh, vaccinate all pregnant women, uh, which uh, all pregnant women should be screened for the hepatitis B virus and the ascites should be treated with salt restriction and diuretics and hepatic encephalopathy patients uh, should have paracentesis performed during the hospitalization. And uh, screening of the esoph uh, esophageal valses should be performed within 12 months if the patient compensates the cirrhosis and within three months in patient with complicated cirrhosis. Any questions, sir? Yeah. Santosh? Yes, sir. What is the role of prophylactic uh, uh, you know, esophageal variceal band ligation if you endoscope them and find varices? Um, you know, if they are fairly substantially big, do you consider doing prophylactic variceal band ligation? Yes. And what is the lit what does the literature say about what you do? If the veins are of fairly large size, and uh, it's better to do it. And if the patient is in child B or child C, uh, definitely required. The other indication where the Size is not large, but somewhere medium sized. Uh, then we may consider doing it if the suppose the patient is coming from a far off uh, place where immediate uh, attention can't be given, and in that case, preventive will be better than just avoiding uh, banding. Lakshman sir, what is your uh, opinion, sir? Sorry, I missed that. Can you come again, please? The, what is the role of prophylactic, uh, uh, you know, endoscopic band ligation huh. when when you actually uh, endoscope people and find that there are significant varices? Only the for patient... grade grade two and grade three. Even grade two is questionable. Yeah. But large varices, grade three, you have there is a role for prophylactic for, banding, for but not not for grade one definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That is the point I wanted to bring out. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, if no more questions, Indraja, go ahead. Santosh, anything else, anything else to add? Yeah, I think it's fairly covered. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Santosh, is there any other marker apart from alpha fetoprotein? Any new markers? So there is something called as uh, PIVKA, which is P-I-V-K-A. Uh, that is, uh, I mean, the transplant teams to use it. It can be elevated when AFP is not very high. So they routinely use it, but we don't, I mean, it's not done uh, at most of the labs. So only so if there is high, uh, high degree of suspicion. So if, for example, on ultrasound or CT, there is possible space occupying lesion, then you, yeah, if then alpha protein is not raised, then you can do PIPCA. Yes. Okay. It's called PUCAR 2. Okay. Shall I continue? Yeah, Indra. Okay. In hepatocellular carcinoma, it is one of the most solid organ tumors worldwide. And in cirrhosis is a major risk factor for the progression of the hepatocellular carcinoma. Every year, more than half million cases of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma are diagnosed worldwide. The annual incidence is about 3 to 5 percent in case of patients with cirrhosis. And the risk factors include uh, the viral hepatitis B, C, cirrhosis, and decompensated cirrhosis, and type 2 diabetes uh, mellitus, aflatoxin exposure, 
increased age male sex and positive family history of the hepatocellular carcinoma and it is also associated with the secondary alcohol abuse and the screening of the uh, hcc includes ultrasound uh, of the abdomen and pelvis every 6 to 12 months and addition of the alpha beta protein to the ultrasound increases the sensitivity but serum aspox protein is no longer recommended because of the uh, poor sensitivity and specificity the lesions less than 1 cm should be followed every 3 to 6 months and if it is more than 1 cm should be investigated using either ct or mri and the characteristic changes over the CT uh, includes the hypervascular uh, with washout on portal venous phase on imaging or AFP more than 200 nanograms per milli ml. These lesions should be treated as HCC. Multiple treatment modalities are available that depend on the tumor size and tumor number and local expertise. In non cirrhotic patients, surgical resection is an option and can be curative. The ultimate therapy of the cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease is liver transplantation. It decreases the risk of recurrence in patients with underlying cirrhosis. The Millen criteria is used to limit the transplantation to patients who are likely to have better outcome. The, the uh, Millen criteria it is, uh, includes four parameters that include single tumor diameter less than 5 cm and not more than 3, 4, 5 of tumor, each one not exceeding 3 cm and there is no angio invasion and no extrahepatic involvement. Patients who meet this criteria have estimated 4-year survival rate of 85% and 4-year recurrence rate of 92%. The indications and contraindications of liver transplantation. These indications include advanced chronic liver disease and child tube score of more than 7 and qualifying male score and acute liver failure and drug Toxins are viral, uh, virus induced permanent hepatitis. And the contraindications uh, include uh, hep HIV positive and methadone dependency, stage 3 hepatocellular carcinoma. Absolute contraindications include hep extra hepatic malignant disease, cholangiocarcinoma, uncontrolled systemic infections, and multi organ failure. The alternative treatments of the hepatocellular carcinoma who do not meet the criteria for surgical resection are radiofrequency ab ablation, chemoembolization, alcohol ablation, and cybernized radiotherapy. The standard objectives uh, for the standard objectives uh, of the cirrhosis uh, in the management includes the early diagnosis of the chronic liver disease and ident uh, identification of the etiology. Evaluation of the patient general health status is important, and we should all uh, we, sh we have uh, we have to think about the financial status of the patient also, and uh, we have to check the parameters of the effectiveness and that controls the side effects of the specific treatments, and avoid administration of the hepatotoxic drug and promote vaccination against the uh, hepatitis B A viruses and pneumococcal viruses. We have to supervise the complications and assist the specialist in identifying the candidates for liver transplantation and we have to also assist the patient requiring the legal problem. Thank you, sir. Indraja. Yes, sir. Never make a mistake of putting a slide up like this. Okay, sir. It's terrible. Nobody can follow this. Nobody can understand. You have to split this. Don't copy and paste. Okay. You have to split this into you could three, have split or, it three, slides. Okay. three yeah. or four slides. Okay. Sir. Don't put it up like this. Okay. Be very reflect very badly on you. Control. Sir, answer as a question. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Continue, sir. Control the Milan criteria. Yes, sir. Keeps on changing the meld score. Can you just uh, talk about you know two minutes about meld score and Milan criteria and the you know the you know, this one for uh, for the transplantation. Sir, a meld score is basically criteria used for transplantation where there is no HCC, it's more of decompensated liver disease. Correct. Yeah. And Milan criteria is if the patient has HCC at what, I mean, uh, there is a cutoff above which you don't do transplant because they have done adequate studies and found that the outcomes are not great if you do above a certain size of tumor. So that is the idea. But if the patient with CLD has HCC, 
but his meld is not above 15 most of the centers use 15 as the uh, to list the transport for list for transport so yeah. in those conditions there is something called as meld exception where because we can't wait till the meld progresses so even though meld is low but the patient has hcc they are listed for transport and there are other conditions where like suppose the patient has hepatorenal syndrome or refractory ascites but his meld may not be above 15 because meld as such has uh, mainly bilirubin prothrombin and creatinine but it doesn't take into account ascites hepatic encephalopathy uh, variceal bleed and all that refractory variceal bleed or repeated variceal bleed so there are certain conditions where even though meld is not reached we list them in transplant and it is called as meld exception points okay so one other thing which i would like the surgical residents to read up is there are different uh, criteria for liver transplant one is bclc which is barcelona liver criteria there is hong kong liver criteria there is uh, there are many indian studies and they have come up with indian criteria like aims criteria and medanta criteria which may not be asked in their exams but for purely for the knowledge or curiosity curiosity sake they can read up and uh, one more thing i think uh, 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 all the surgeons in this group should be senior surgeons should be uh, they can guide me in this suppose the patient has cirrhosis and has a inguinal hernia or an umbilical hernia how do we go about if the patient has a uh, i mean should we do it as a routine should we do it at a early stage how do we treat them i, I think if you are many most of the patients with cirrhosis with ascites uh, will have an umbilical hernia so hmm. if it is only either ulceration or it's causing symptoms only then you deal with it inguinal hernia again i think it's only symptomatic inguinal hernia you deal with because otherwise suppose uh, there's strangulation or... yeah any pain discomfort or you know uh, symptoms regular symptoms then you can probably do it under local anesthesia because any anesthesia in such patients would be quite risky so you may be able to do it under local anesthesia i yeah, think I, the, I, yes sir yes sir i think, I think presence or absence of ascites is key yeah. Not just cirrhosis. If the patient has uncomplicated hernia, in fact, asymptomatic hernia with cirrhosis, but well compensated without ascites, he should be treated like any other patient. But yeah. if he has ascites, unless the patient is symptomatic, we don't touch him and try and get the ascites under control and then deal with the hernia if time permits. In an absolute emergency, of course, you will have to go ahead, bite the bullet and do it. Other thing is the, the Milan criteria in which is, you know, as uh, Santosh has rightly mentioned, there is Barcelona criteria as well. But the Milan criteria is currently the sort of, uh, I wouldn't say gold standard, but it is the, I think, sort of the um, most used uh, criteria yes. they, that they fo the followed all over the world. Yeah. And uh, yes, what the, they have extended it to about 7 to 7.5 centimeters, uh, you know, hepatocellular carcinoma, that is one tumor or a combination of three tumors. I think, uh, you know, 7 point, and then there are situations what is called as non-conforming, uh, you know, the criteria to the criteria. You can do transplants in exceptional circumstances as, as long as the patient understands that the recurrence rates and complications are higher. One point where uh, it's mentioned that Milan and BCLC, whatever criteria, these, those were done on European patients where hepatitis C is the main, uh, I mean, at least the main cause. Hepatitis C related HCC is supposed to be very aggressive. Yeah. And that's why their uh, threshold for transplant is lower. But at the same time, Hong Kong, where the hepatitis B is more common or alcohol, there they have extended the limit and tried to do transplants even in slightly bigger tumors. Yeah. 
Okay, I think uh, Shrikan sir had one more question. Uh, four year, uh, sir, uh, four year recurrence rate of ninety two percent. Is it worth transplanting in HCC? I don't recurrence think free. Recurrence, free. recurrence free. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Lakshman sir has clarified. Yeah. Okay. So any more any more questions or any more uh, clarifications you want from Santosh or Indraja? Um, no, sir. No, 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 I'm asking the other PG's postgraduate. Sorry, sir. Okay. Sir, uh, anything can, else, sir? Can I make Help? a comment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Indraja, yes, these, sir. Are, these are subject seminars. Yes, sir. Which means that the presenter will make an in-depth study of the subject. Okay, sir. Uh, from your presentation, I do not think you have read any papers. You probably taken information from standard textbooks, reference textbooks. I keep urging all postgraduates go beyond textbooks and read review articles yes, for you to understand and get the grasp of the subject properly. Yes, and you must, you must put the references there on your slides, wherever you give some information. I, I saw you do it for Schwartz. Beyond that, I didn't see any references unless I missed any. Had you read? Put, yes, sir. Yes, I she had put some uh, Ahmed somebody. Huh. I, I read no, but yes. that is that is why last class also and previous classes also you have commented that you please put in uh, this kind of uh, subject seminars the reference articles and the bottom of the slide where you have used. Yeah. Not okay. somewhere else where we, nobody can make out anything. Yeah. Okay. And yes. and also it's a surgical seminar. Okay. So uh, uh, you should have been more uh, uh, expansive about the surgical procedures and uh, you couldn't even ask, answer the basic uh, questions regarding the surgical interventions. Although they are outdated or nobody is doing them, but you should be aware. Yes. Those are the questions which will be put. The, the, okay. principles, are, the principles are important, whether it's being yes. done at the moment or not, but the principles. Correct. Basic pathology, yes. why did they come about? And that is that basic knowledge is a requirement for postgraduates. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ravishankar, sir. See, the, you know, when uh, I think the, it was a topic on liver transplantation, um, as sir said very, very succinctly, uh, for when we were doing the liver transplantation, I actually went back and started reading for, you know, the trials and tribulations of Tom, uh, Professor Thomas Tazel and how, how hard he had to fight with the entire establishment to get liver transplant going. So the thing is, it is so, so exciting and so interesting, even though liver transplant is not my subject. I read the whole, you know, about 100 page document. So you need to have that kind of enthusiasm to, you know, read and, you know, cross references and go back and read journals and put it up because I think that is what we expect of you. Textbooks, we can all read. I think you should make an effort to, you know, put, you know, at least the latest journals, as the sir said, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, whatever is there uh, to, you know, for, to bring us up to the current, sta you know, standard rather than just 10 year or five year ago, because textbooks will be that much. Yes. But I think, uh, your presentation, you know, your presentation skills have improved, but I think you have probably not made enough effort to go through the, you know, the surgical aspects of it. Yes. Srikant? Srikant, sir. Yeah, what you have said is correct. You have to go, <clears throat> go through the, all the textbooks, plus standard reference art, but you have to read the tapetability textbook. You get a lot of information from there. Yes. And this can be used as for the to study for the exams also. It may come as main question, no? Yes, sir. That's why. Nilanjan, your comments. I, I think I commented uh, already. So Santosh. Santosh. Is there a yes, Santosh? Sir. Yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah, I think it was yeah, a good presentation. Comments. Yeah, I think they should be knowing a few finer details. And, uh, yeah. Niranjan, can I make a final comment? Sure, sir. Sure, sir. Um, I think we should congratulate uh, Janani if she is there and uh, Munishekar uh, for uh, you know getting prizes in the state conference. 
congratulations to both of them yeah yeah definitely definitely and Just, congr- both of them are not there and uh, you know be- congratulations to lakshman sir for an excellent uh, uh, a professor aj narendran oration i i am sure i have yes, I, sir, absolutely. i have been a great student of uh, dr narendran because i was in his unit all the three the third year okay. and final year postings okay. and i have i was one of i lived opposite him so i used to meet him regularly i am sure he would have been very proud to hear your lecture sir it was thank fantastic you. thank you very much i didn't know you were his student you were his student yeah thank and you he, yes, he actually used to invite me varo beer kudi ante anta every day because <laughs> i stayed in ramkrishna ashram his house was opposite right namage yaro antaru sidilo alla pa okay okay sir i think we can conclude okay. uh, thank night. you thank you sir good night good night thank thank, thank you santosh thank good you. night thank you thank you santosh thank, thank you very much lot thank of you, sir, uh, lot of insights and good information thank you thank you thank, thank you sir thank you sir.